Viewer Ashley Baraniak asks, what do you like and dislike the most about award season? Suddenly people are talking about movies in a much more intelligent way than they are the rest of the year, which a guy like me appreciates. I know that it's very self-congratulatory and it's the time when Hollywood pats itself on the back, but it's also a time when Hollywood gets roasted a little bit mm-hmm. when you've got a good host. Yeah. And I think Kimmel's going to do that well. But what I think annoys me the most is when people say the Oscars don't matter. It's something that means a lot to that person. And then once they win one, their price tag goes up. It's important for them. It's important for the studio. And often it is societally important, depending on what the performance is or who the actor is. You know, sometimes that can be a a tiny step forward for society. Do you have an example? Hattie McDaniel. But what great advance was that? She still had to watch the show from the kitchen. I said tiny step. Sidney Poitier was more important. But really what's most important is when it's not a novelty anymore when an African-American wins an Oscar. For the last couple years, I've been watching the red carpet. They never did that before. My wife loves the red carpet, so I watch that now too. It's fun to see who looks good, who made a bad choice. That ties in with... What my least favorite thing about the award season is, participants, particularly women, are forced to put so much effort into how they look. Well, they're not forced. There's a handful There's of a, yeah, actresses. Yeah, but it's always notable. It's like, oh, when Sharon Stone showed up and she was just wearing a turtleneck. <laughs> I mean, pants. She wore pants, I think, too. Just a long turtleneck and nothing else would, would be a very bold and sexy statement. Yeah, yeah. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. It's late February, Craig, which means we just celebrated Valentine's Day. So it's time for a little bit of romance here in the basement. Bromance? Romance. Oh, thank God. Love and marriage. Love and marriage. They go together like something and something. Yes. I'm taking you to a wedding today, Craig. You are? And there ain't no wedding like my big fat Greek wedding. (laughs) Oh, well. Released in 2002... MBFGW stars Nia Vardalos, John Corbett, and Welcome to the Basement alum, Andrea Martin. Vardalos based the screenplay on her one-woman show of the same name, and she would go on to receive an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay. This is the highest grossing romantic comedy of all time. Whoa! Grossing over $368 million worldwide, which is pretty good considering its $5 million budget. That's pretty good, I guess. It spawned the short-lived and poorly received television series My Big Fat Greek Life in 2003 and a sequel in 2016. This was so loved when it first came out, but no one talks about it anymore. It seems like it's the avatar of romantic comedies. It was a huge deal, and then it just... But it is one of those titles that has staying power, right up there with Sex Lies and Videotape. Sure, yeah. But there'll always be big, fat things. A wedding? It's just a big party? Yeah. Next time you throw a party, I have a little something here that will help you show people how sophisticated and funny you are. I'm a Noel coward. They are cock... cock... they are cock... (laughs) They're cocktail napkins, and they seem to have a New Yorker cartoon emblazoned upon them. Susan, this might just be the wine talking, but I think I want to order more wine. Those bells are ringing, so position yourself outside of the temporary wedding chapel that is the old leather couch, and get your handful of rice ready, because we're going to celebrate my big fat Greek wedding! Every time the Playtone logo shows up, Tom Hanks should just shout, Playtone! <laughs> Isn't that, this is like a Greek dance? Or am I doing Fiddler on the Roof? <laughs> you, might, you might be doing a Muppet doing Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> Shut that bloody bazooki off! <laughs> Tula Portokalos grew up Greek, and boy did she ever. Her family is the most Greek family anyone has ever seen. Got her mother Maria and her father Gus. My dad believed in only two things. That Greeks should educate non-Greeks about being Greek. And Zeus. And that any ailment, from psoriasis to poison ivy, could be cured with Windex. Tula has a brother, Nick. Then there's her cousin, Nikki. Nikki's got the hair. And Yaya, their grandmother, who thinks that the Turks are still out to get her. 
For this old woman, evil eye is just sort of like a baseline. It's like resting bitch face, but it's resting evil eye face. Everyone wants Tula to get married to a nice Greek boy, but she's already 30 and she's pretty frumpy. Their family owns Dancing Zorba's restaurant. Somebody gave me the mati. Put some Windex on. Oh, God, please, please. Does he have a Windex holster he's yeah, pulling that he, out of? He's, uh, he's like uh, Travis Bickle. He has like the <laughs> spring-loaded thing in his arm. <laughs> so when he talks to himself in the mirror, at the same time he cleans the mirror. Okay. What okay? No okay. She's not okay. Look, Athena's married with three children. You know what? Greeks are just Italians with a totally different culture. <laughs> and I'll get married, Pops. I promise. Why don't you marry your sister Tula? You both need to get married, so... Uh, wait a minute, that's the Windex talking. Never mind. Oh, sing. Sing, Tula. <laughs> Somewhere out there. This guy named Ian shows up in Zorba's, and he is handsome and single. Tula is transfixed with him. But she's too shy to talk to him, so she hides. She's doing her John the Baptist routine. Dad, I've been going through um, our inventory. Ray Windex on it. I think I could help run the business better if we got a computer. But I got all A's in computers. Tell him you got all alphas. <laughs> He'll understand then. And Gus gets angry. He values tradition and wants things to stay the same. And he wants Tula to get married. And what is wrong with Tula going to school downtown? He's drugs downtown. What are you saying? Are you saying that Tula will get involved with drugs? No, that's the problem. She would be cool then. <laughs> but when she goes to college, she kind of blooms a little bit. She realizes that she's dressed like a sack of potatoes. She starts to put on a little makeup. She does a little something with her hair. She gets some nicer clothes. Basically, she improves herself in a montage, as people do in the movies. Computers and terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> Have you considered a life of Russian hacking? Suvlaki, Tadziki, ooh, I won't be Greeky. <laughs> and she's offered a job at Aunt Vula's travel agency. So she's Tula and the aunt is Vula? I guess so. And you're a Fula. I am Give not. me some Moolah. No. Why not? I mean... Because. Okay. Okay. Tula and Vula, they are travel agents together and there's computers involved. Who should happen to wander by but Ian? At first she hides from him again. Sure wish I had object permanence. Eventually they get together and they hit it off. They go out on a date. Dancing Zorbas. My family owns that restaurant. A and it's haunted, so we can't go there. <laughs> they go on a second date. I'm Greek, right? She's Greek? Her family's crazy. And they're Greek. Ian isn't Greek. No one in my family has ever gone out with a non-Greek before. I don't care. I really like you. We should see if this works. Mmm, you taste like cucumber and dill. They go out on a lot of dates, and they start doing a lot of kissing in the car. PG levels of kissing. Why is she limping? What did he do to her? <laughs> Cousin Nikki shows up and she says, I know what's going on with you. You're dating someone, and he's blatantly not Greek. Gus is furious. This boy should have come to him and asked his permission to date his daughter. May I please date your daughter? No! <laughs> <laughs> her parents try to fix her up with various single Greek men. This doesn't work at all because they're each more ghoulish than the last. Meanwhile, she's dating an Adonis over here. On the sly. Where are we? My apartment. Finally, he figures this one out. Take if you have place. an apartment, you don't have to make out in a car all the time. Yeah. Cars are fun to make out with when you live with your parents. Did I say make out with the car? You did. Pervert. I don't know why you got that Prius. <laughs> you want some sweet young thing? I like my I like my, my cars to be quiet when I make out with them. <laughs> she goes back to his place, and I think you can imagine what happens there. Tula goes and has dinner with Ian's parents. The Miller family. And boy, are they white. The practically albino levels of white. I don't know how they got a brunette boy out of this couple, but they did. Naturally, it's awkward, because they're squares. So typical of Hollywood movies. The man having his shirt off, being sexualized. <laughs> Ian proposes. She is thrilled. The family is not. They love each other. She didn't do this to you or to me. She did it to Greece. 
and to God. And leaves space. Sometimes that space is so big that the roof can't support itself, so it collapses. He teaches theoretical carpentry. Yeah. Gus gives his consent, but he insists that Ian be baptized into the Greek Orthodox Church. There is a very elaborate baptism ceremony. Stay down. <laughs> <laughs> it's Easter. The entire family is getting together to celebrate, and they are ecstatic about this engagement. Does he have any brothers? <laughs> I want to make my father unhappy, too. <laughs> Wedding plans are being made. I come to this country with eight dollars in my pocket. And I had 40,000 in my bank account. I was very wealthy. <laughs> Look at you, how big you are. <laughs> too soon, too soon, too soon. Too soon for what? Did the kid make a 9-11 joke? <laughs> <laughs> it's 2002. Uh, it's too it soon. Was, that, that it's would way be... too soon, kid. Turns out Tula's brother Nick is an aspiring artist. It's not something we really need to know, but we find out anyway. I'm gonna start slowly, you know, do a couple of couple of night courses. I'm a three-dimensional character too. I, you know, maybe I should get my own movie. My big fat Greek art class. Ian's parents, the Wasps, are invited to the Portocalos family home for a quiet dinner. But little does Tula know that her mother invited the entire family. So it is anything but a quiet dinner. It is a huge outdoor luau with all kinds of commotion. Welcome to my home. We are here to overwhelm you. The Millers are a little bit befuddled by all this. There's a uh, confusion over a bunt cake. It's a bunt. A bun? Bunt. Bun, bon, bonk, bonk. Bunt. Who just says bunt? He okay. says bunt cake. <laughs> it's a bunt. She's the one who's being stupid. All my life, I had a lump at the back of my neck, right here. Inside the lump, he found teeth and a spinal column. Yes, inside the lump was my twin. Don't tell them the lump story. <laughs> Whatever you do. And don't show them your special jar. They are given lots of ouzo and they get drunk which is probably a good thing. They need to loosen up a little. Dad is upset that his daughter is marrying into this lifeless family. That family is like a piece of toast. It's like they never even heard of a lump. Is my marriage killing Dad? Too loud. Windex poisoning is killing your father, not your marriage. Oh, and here's Yaya, and she's got her old wedding box, and here are the crowns for the wedding. Now you are bound to me and forced to do my bidding. <laughs> this house is adorkable. Dorkable. Or I, I've been trying to figure out some sort of column joke this entire time. You know, Alanis Morissette wrote a song about this house. Isn't it ionic? <laughs> Don't you think? It's a little too ionic. And now it's the big day. All of the ladies are getting their nails done and the faces done and their mustaches done. <laughs> what? They scream and they run around the house. Tula's got a zit. That always happens on an important day, doesn't it? Nick! Go to the airport and pick up the band. Okay. See, 2002, I think their wedding band would be Modest Mouse. <laughs> we may be lambs in the kitchen, but we are tigers in the bedroom. We are hummingbirds in the garden. We are catfish in the basement. And we are a lump on the back of the neck. <laughs> they need to get cover up, and they're not dressed yet, and they have to get dressed, and they finally get dressed. And look at Tula, she's dressed, and she's a beautiful bride. I'm a snow beast. Please, save the vows until the wedding. And I wish you hadn't written your own. I'm a snow beast. <laughs> I promise <laughs> to love and cherish and menace you in my snow cave for the you, rest of our lives. You shall be a yeti hunter. <laughs> Is this the wedding? There is a very long and very Greek wedding ceremony. The Millers loosen up a little bit. Oh, Greek to me. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're her best black cowl. <laughs> they take their first steps as husband and wife, and then it's off to the reception. They're throwing rice, but it's stuffed into grape leaves. <laughs> Gus gives a surprisingly touching speech, and Tula and Ian find out that he's given them a very special gift. They bought us a house. Top of that, Millars. <laughs> there is no bigger gift than house. You give them plain, might cost more, but they don't live in it. <laughs> Come on! Oh, no, no. I can't dance or I'll have an orgasm. <laughs> and then they dance. This is a fat Greek wedding after all. Years pass. They have a little daughter of their own. But mom, I want to go to 
brownies. I know. Mom, I want a sequel where I get married. Great school. Um. Gus is using Windex for what it was actually intended for. That shows character development. Yeah. That's her big fat Greek hootie do. Opa! My big fat Greek wedding. It's official. We've watched it. With all four of our eyes. What we have here is a little comedy of manners based on broad ethnic humor. Yeah. What did you think of the humor in this? I didn't laugh much. I heard you laughing. Hey, Ian. We're gonna kill ya! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happened like four times. Yep. The biggest negative takeaway from looking at this family, and by extension looking at Greek culture, from what this movie shows us, is that they seem to be unconcerned and often clueless as to what other people want and need. They just go ahead and order the invitations. They don't consult anybody. They just go ahead and order those bridesmaids dresses because I thought that's what you wanted. Oh! When you have these big family movies, the thing that draws people into it who, who aren't Greek are the universal thing. My mother's kind of like that. My cousin's kind of like that. The only quote-unquote offensive characters in this are the Millers. The... <laughs> They're these people who are so square, they're paralyzed with awkwardness at everything. I suppose you have to really strike a balance when you have cultures clashing, which one of them are the explorers and which one of them are the Martians. And you have to balance that because you don't want it to teeter too much. And I don't know that they did that. If you compare this to The Big Sick, which is not a perfect movie, but really it is much better at balancing out the two sides of the culture instead of broad strokes showing in very fine detail what a Pakistani family is like as immigrants here. Vardalos didn't go that extra step to make characters a little bit more human okay. instead of these broad cartoons. So if you feel like this movie is not that great, which I'm, I'm sensing that, where do you think all of the box office comes from? How did this become the biggest grossing romantic comedy of all time? I don't know. If this movie was called My Big Fat Italian Wedding, mm -hmm. wouldn't have done anything. Well, I think it's the Greek thing, because people don't know a lot about Greek culture. They know more about Italian culture, well, yeah. and they know Italian weddings. It didn't ring that many of my bells. Well, it's sincere. It has heart. It's not snarky or smarmy. It's not overtly sexual. Mm -hmm. If you go to any thrift store in America and look in their DVD section, you will find two to four copies of My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Now, why do you suppose this is? What's the journey from buying the DVD... To getting rid of it. I think I have the answer. What is the answer? Bachelorette parties and wedding showers. Oh, uh, yeah. Or Valentine's Day. Here, honey, I bought you this romantic comedy. I'll even watch it with you and I won't complain. And then they watch it once and they never want to watch it again. I was expecting that this movie was going to be a lot more about the wedding. Well, I wasn't expecting this big, long build-up going back to when she was a child and everything. And so I think that threw me off a little bit, too, because the movie wasn't the one I was expecting. And what you always have to remember going into a movie is your expectations don't mean anything. <laughs> that's just a lie you're telling yourself, when really you have to accept the movie that's given you. Basically, the movie is her life, up to mm -hmm. the point where she gets married. Yeah. Once again, if it was called My Big Fat Greek Life, would not have done those numbers at the box office. Yeah, it's wedding. the wedding that brought them in. Oh, yeah. I want to see this wedding. Maybe it's just the fact that I'm living in 2017 as opposed to 2002. 2018 now. Now that I think about it, I was expecting Nico to be revealed as gay. Mm. That was something that nowadays seems like an inevitability. The bachelor son, we're Oop. gonna find out about him. What did you do? Nothing. Who did you see? No one. Wait a minute. Well, this movie was fine. Yeah. It had some nice humor, it had a nice heart. Anytime you see Andrea Martin is a good day. We could have done a lot worse than My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And we could have done better if we had a lot of shots of Uzo in us. Well, if you haven't seen this movie, you should check it out, maybe with your sweetheart. And now, you can check out Seen It. Seen It! Our theme for Seen It tonight, Oscars 2018. Caitlin McDougall writes, Have you guys seen Nolan's Dunkirk? I felt it was nerve-wracking start to finish, thanks to Hans Zimmer's score, and was beautifully shot. My favorite thing about Dunkirk is that the main character is the war. Mm -hmm. All of these other characters in it are almost not characters at all. They have no backstory. 
Most of them don't even have names. They are all made to look absolutely the same. They're all pale-skinned brunettes. They want to show that all of these people are interchangeable. They're all the same man being saved off the beach. Yeah, you know, it's a tough year to categorically say what you think the best picture is, but I think this is the movie that really struck me the most and stayed with me the most. Oh, he uses time in that movie. Yeah. His... And that's the editing. That's why it's going to win Best Editing. Ryan Lux. Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Every character was deeply human. Seen it. Seen it. The main character in Dunkirk was war. The main character in Three Billboards is grief. Mm-hmm. Yes. The grief that drives us to do bold things, heroic things, stupid things, and horrible things. Yes. Sometimes those things are all the same thing. I've talked about Zeitgeist in the past. Mm-hmm. And that the best picture is the the picture that captures the zeitgeist of that year. And I think Three Billboards does that. Just the moral ambiguity of it. I think people really want stories that are in the here and now and that are about contemporary issues and stories that are messy as hell. Mm -hmm. And don't give us answered questions. They only give us more questions. Yeah. This movie really grabbed me right away because it presents you with expectations and then immediately confounds them. You think, okay, this is the wronged mother. These are the negligent police. I know this story. Wait a minute. She's not the hero I thought she was. They're not the villains I thought they were. What the hell's going on? I think that there is a lot of truth behind all of the characters. The movies that are the best are the ones that are emotionally true. Sam Rockwell's character. In the movie, they call him the racist cop. Yeah. And then the audience calls him the racist cop. Right. He tortured a black suspect. But you also see him torture a white guy later on. Yeah. And really, I think he's just a really bad cop. Yeah. And I think in his mind, he's like, I'm not racist. They're missing the point. They should be complaining about me in a completely different way. Sure. And that's one of the big criticisms of this. The movie is not explicitly about race, Mm -hmm. but the black community is talked about. Yeah. And they're a backdrop to the story, but there's no character in the movie that actually represents them in a meaningful way. Yeah. And And I think that's a valid criticism. Gath Echoes writes, seen it, The Shape of Water. Michael Shannon's performance in this film is both amazing and gruesome. Seen it. Seen it. I was not as awestruck by The Shape of Water as I thought I was going to be. Neither was I. The problem is two-dimensional characters. I know that Del Toro is telling a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. But still, Michael Shannon is just this irredeemable villain with no layers to him at all. But you get a backdrop of Shannon's life. He's tricked into buying a car. That's that's as deep as we go into that problem. Yeah. It's a great performance. Yeah. The new movie's beautiful. The production design, cinematography, get Oscars opening, for all that. The opening shot of the movie with the water filled apartment is like that is that was worth the price of admission right there. But the story really left me cold. Cold uh, fish. Robin Faulkner. I was so excited when I Tanya came out. I've been waiting for this movie to come out since the incident happened. All the actors did their research and it showed. Seen it. Seen it. I'm glad it didn't get a Best Picture nomination, because I don't think it deserved it. The main problem with it, other than the fact that in one scene you're supposed to believe that Margot Robbie is 15, not going to happen. But she does a great job, but go on. 20 minutes into the film, Tanya Harding turns to the camera and directly addresses the audience. I think if you're going to do that, you need to do it in like the first five minutes of the film. Yeah. This narrative device is inconsistently used throughout the film. And when you have the interviews... Why do you need that? It just seemed like too much style, and it clashed with each other. A lot of people have compared this movie to Goodfellas, that is Goodfellas on Ice. It's a lot closer to the big short, up to casting Margot Robbie. So it has that vibrancy to it, but also, like the big short, people will see a falseness to it. Go to our website, welcometothebasementshow.com. Click on the PayPal donation button. You can make a donation to support this show, a one-time or a rolling monthly donation. Anyone of note do that lately, Matt? They're all of note, Craig. They're all of note. But here is one of them. Aaron, who says, I look forward to sharing many more hours laughing with and learning from you. You can find out who the rest of our donors are and you can see the contents of our mail crate right here. Look at all that stuff. We're going to be opening it all up on unboxing. And that's going to be coming out this coming Friday. You okay? Yeah. All that mail. Thanks for joining us for the blessed event that is My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And now you should join us for this. I was Frump Girl. I don't remember Frump Girl, but I remember you. I guess you'll say what 
can make me feel this way. What? Frump girl. Frump girl. Frump girl. Whoa, whoa. Frump, Frump girl. girl. Frump, Frump girl. girl. We're gonna kill you. <laughs>